Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we're checking out the new Intel Core i9-11900K. This is their new flagship CPU. And for those of you who missed it, I did check out the more mid-range Core i5-11600K yesterday. Found it to be a decent offering, though at the MSRP, it's not really competitive with the Ryzen 5 5600X. But with that CPU currently overpriced, I felt the best six core option for those of you buying right now is actually the older 10th gen Core i5 10600K, or even better, the $200 US KF model. The Core i9 11900K though, at a list price of $540 US in thousand unit quantities and a current retail price of $615 US at places like Newegg, and no, that's not a third party listing, the new mainstream desktop Core i9 part, it's a complete joke. So much so that I almost couldn't be bothered reviewing it. Actually, I'll be honest, I really can't be bothered reviewing this thing, but I know there'll be some of you that want to see how it stacks up in games, so here we are. And even at $540 US, I just don't know why this thing even exists, other than to take advantage of helpless Intel fanboys. And I know that sounds harsh, but you'll understand where I'm coming from once we have a look at the benchmark graphs. Also, it is worth keeping in mind that the 12-core, 24-thread Ryzen 9 5900X also costs $550 US, and although availability hasn't been particularly great for that part, the performance deficit is going to be pretty ugly in most tests. If you missed Tim's announcement video a few weeks ago discussing pricing and specifications of these new 11th gen core processors, here's a quick refresher for the 11900K. Unlike the 10 core 20 thread 10900K, the 11900K is actually an 8 core 16 thread CPU packing a 16 megabyte L3 cache, and a 125 watt TDP. Yet despite featuring less L3 cache and fewer cores, the price has increased from $490 US to $540. So that's a 10% price hike for 20% fewer cores. That said, it is a little more complicated than that as the 11th gen architecture is entirely different to that of the 10th gen series that came before it. So Rocket Lake is a new architecture or rather a hybrid architecture that's backported Ice Lake's 10 nanometer Sunny Cove cores, hence why they changed the name of the cores to Cypress Cove in the Rocket Lake architecture. Now this makeshift solution seems entirely unnecessary to me. Really all Intel needed to do here was keep prices of their 10th gen lineup where they currently are. So well under that of AMD's Ryzen 3 parts, and they would have sold well enough. So in my opinion, Intel just needed to make the price cuts official, and we'd change our CPU recommendations for viewers. Instead, they went through the difficult process of backporting newer designs, and in the case of the 11900K, they made a CPU that's more expensive to produce than the 10900K, and in many ways, it's worse. This is all the more confusing once you realize that their upcoming 12th generation is right around the corner and should be much better. The 12th gen core series codenamed Elder Lake is expected later this year, and with it we should see Intel transition to its 10 nanometer process for desktop CPUs while also adopting a new LGA 1700 socket and other technologies like DDR5 memory. That being the case, why even release Rocket Lake? And why release new Z590 motherboards that won't support the upcoming 12th gen parts? Again, why bother with any of this? I've got to assume here that the motivation is to try and boost CPU revenue. All indications point to pretty weak Intel CPU sales over the past year. So Intel's probably banking on bold new performance claims and a shiny new look to boost sales. And the fact that they're gonna end up burning customers like what they did with the seventh gen series is unlikely to keep them up at night. Anyway, you can probably tell that not that keen on this release and the Core i9-11900K won't be getting my recommendation, but rather than just end the review here, let's at least check out the results, though I will be skipping more than half of our productivity benchmarks. For testing the Intel CPUs, I used the Gigabyte Aorus Z590 Master using BIOS version F5A. The board was configured with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 dual rank dual channel memory, and for the cooler, the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capelix White was used. Essentially, this is a 360mm AIO. All this hardware was installed in the Corsair 5000D airflow case and powered by the RM850X power supply. The Ryzen test system features the same cooler, though the black version, the same memory and power supply, with the only key change, of course, being the motherboard, and we're using the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. 
Please note for this video, we're going to look exclusively at results for Intel CPUs that aren't power limited, so no TDP limited testing. This is typically how we test Intel CPUs, and this is because, well, this is how the majority of Z490 and Z590 motherboards operate out of the box. So while we will be using the default clock multiplier tables, none of the Intel CPUs are adhering to any power limits. Finally, all configurations were tested with a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti for productivity benchmarks, but all the gaming benchmarks were conducted with the newer GeForce RTX 3090. Okay, let's get into the results. As I said, I'm going to skip over most of the productivity testing as the results are pretty boring. As you'd probably expect, the 11900K is indeed slower than the 10900K while costing more, so a bit of a bust for productivity. The Cinebench R20 multi-core results sum it up pretty well. When compared to the previous Gen 8 core parts, so the 10700K, the 11900K looks good as it boosted performance by 20%. But the new 8 core part isn't priced to replace the 10700K, but rather the 10900K, and in that matchup, it was 8% slower, an impressive effort for a CPU with 20% fewer cores, but also not impressive given the price. The real issue for the 11900K though is AMD's Ryzen 9 5900X, which just happens to be a whopping 42% faster in this test. That's no small margin, and you certainly wouldn't expect both CPUs to occupy the same price point based on that result. Then when looking at single core performance, we see that the 11900K is 14% faster than the 10900K, but also 2% slower than the 5900X. So even for single or lightly threaded workloads, the 11900K is unlikely to beat the 12 core AMD processor. Again, Intel has managed to go backwards with the new Core i9 processor. This time the 11900K was 4% slower than the 10900K in the seven zip compression test. And that meant it was 30% slower than the 5900X. And things get even worse when measuring decompression performance. Here the 11900K was 16% slower than the 10900K and 40% slower than the 5900X. So a similar margin to what we saw in the Cinebench R20 multi-threaded test. The 11900K did manage to match the performance of the 10900K in the Adobe Premiere Pro 2020 benchmark, but it was also 8% slower than the 5900X. So a bit of a hollow victory there. Moving over to the Blender Open Data benchmark, and we see that the 11900K is again slower than the old 10900K, this time trailing by an 8% margin. Obviously though, if you have around $500 to spend on a CPU, and you'll be doing a lot of core heavy productivity tasks like rendering, the 5900X is the way to go, and here the Ryzen 9 part offered 40% more performance. And this is the icing on the cake for AMD, or the death blow for Intel. We just saw that the Ryzen 9 5900X was 40% faster in Blender, so a massive margin in favour of AMD there, but it also managed to produce that huge performance margin while also consuming 25% less power than the 11900K. So 40% more performance, 25% less power. Probably don't need to say much more, let's move on to the games and see if the 11900K can redeem itself there. Kicking off the gaming benchmarks, we have Watch Dogs Legion, and here the 11900K does manage to make its way to the top of our chart, boosting performance from the 10900K by 3%. Not exactly an exciting margin, but it is better than going backwards. It also meant the 11900K was 4% faster than the 5900X, again, not exactly a noteworthy margin, but at least it managed to pull ahead. Unfortunately, performance in F1 2020 did regress. We're looking at a 6% drop in frame rate down to 261 FPS, which admittedly is more than enough. But when comparing products directly, it did mean that the 11900K was 4% slower than the 5900X, which isn't going to help Intel claim the gaming performance crown. Testing with Horizon Zero Dawn saw no performance improvement for the 11900K over the 10900K, and that meant we were looking at Ryzen 9 5900X like performance. The 11900K also only matched the 10900K in Borderlands 3, making it 6% faster than the 5900X, which admittedly is a small margin, but at least it is a clear win here for Intel. Moving on to Death Stranding, and here we see that the 11900K edged out the 10900K by a 5% margin, but unfortunately that meant it was still 7% slower than the 5900X. So again, results like this make it difficult for Intel to claim the gaming crown. Once again, we're looking at virtually identical performance between the 11900K and 10900K, and again, that meant the new 11th gen processor was slower than the Ryzen 9 5900X. In this Hitman 2 example, it was 6% slower. The Star Wars Squadron's results are a bit brutal. Here, the 11900K was 9% slower than the old 10900K, 
but even worse was the 11% margin it trailed the 5900X by. So not a good result for Intel's new flagship Core i9 processor. Series SAM 4 is another example where the 11900K ends up being a step backwards for Intel as it loses out to the older 10900K by a 9% margin. Though much worse than that was the huge 18% loss it suffered to the 5900X. The Core i9 10900K was a bit of a beast in Rainbow Six Siege, and while you can certainly argue the relevance of 538 FPS, it was still the fastest CPU in this game. Unfortunately, we're again seeing a situation where the 11900K ends up reducing performance, dropping frame rates by a 7% margin to come in just behind the 5900X. Last up, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here the 11900K was just 2% faster than the 10900K, but hey, at least it was faster. And that also meant that it basically matched the 5900X, coming in just 2% slower. Okay, so here's a look at the 10 game average, and as you can see, Intel's certainly not taking the gaming crown with their 11th gen core series, at least not based on our sample of games. In fact, they've managed the rather unimpressive feat of reducing overall performance as the 11900K came in 2% behind the 10900K, and that made it 4% slower than the 5900X. That's really an insignificant margin, and it means both CPUs will enable the same gaming experience when using more typical quality settings with a super high-end GPU like the RTX 3090, so 1440p or greater. So at least for gaming, it just doesn't matter. But why spend roughly the same amount of money for a power-hungry 8-core processor when you can get a much more efficient 12-core model from AMD that's way faster for productivity tasks? That's really the main issue with the Core i9 11900K. The price just doesn't make sense. Like, not even a little bit of sense. And assuming good availability of both the 11900K and 5900X, with both available at the MSRP, there is quite literally no reason to buy the Intel offering. It's objectively worse at everything, and often much worse. Also, you have to overlook the fact that the cheaper 10900K, which was released a year ago, is faster in most applications, certainly faster for core heavy workloads, and it's basically on par for gaming performance. Right now, the 10900K can be had for $460 over at Newegg, while the 11900K is $615. Obviously, it's not worth 34% more, so again, why did Intel even bother? Now, if you're wondering what an acceptable price for a part like the 11900K might be, I'd say around $400 to $420, would be reasonable. That's based on the fact that the Ryzen 7 5800X, which is also an 8-core processor, costs $450, and it delivers comparable gaming and application performance while using significantly less power. In a way, I've actually just reviewed the 11700K, which, as luck would have it, comes in at $400 US, though that's the 1,000 unit price, so it costs more like $420 US at retail, which is just acceptable based on my previous estimate. The 11700K is based on slightly worse silicon than the 11900K, but overall performance will be very similar. Right now, you can purchase the Core i7-10700KF for just $300, and that would be the 8-core CPU to buy at the moment. I should note, though, that the sale will end soon, so if that part returns to $380, you might as well just buy AMD at that point. So for now, Intel's hanging on by their teeth, and they desperately need Outer Lake to deliver the goods, hopefully later this year, before AMD counterpunch with Zen 4. So hopefully we have some exciting battles to come, because right now, Intel's 11th gen is just not it, at least not at the high end. And that's really all I have to say about the 11900K. As expected, it sucks in terms of value, and absolutely nobody should buy it. So if you liked this honest take, well, feel free to give it a like. We appreciate that. You can subscribe for more content. I've actually just purchased the Core i5-11400F. That actually looks to be pretty good value, and I'll be testing it on some B560 motherboards. So that content will be coming up on the channel soonish. Depends on when all that stuff arrives and how much time I have for testing, but it is a priority. And of course, I will be looking at a heap of Z590 motherboard VRM thermal testing. I'll be starting with the most affordable two motherboards from each brand. So it should be like an eight board roundup to kick things off. So that should be good. Also, if you'd like to get more involved with the channel, support Harbor Unbox so we can buy CPUs that manufacturers won't send us and motherboards that uh, board makers won't send us, well, you can join us over at Floatplane or Patreon. So links for those in the video description. You'll get access to some pretty cool perks, uh, exclusive Discord chat, monthly live streams to myself, Q&As, behind the scenes videos. So yeah, if you're interested, check that stuff out. If not perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.